this morning on uh, Radio Sverige, Sveriges Radio, eller vad någon säger. There was a story on how the trains are stopped due to a DDoS attack. And also some stories about some of your energy generators systems using not even default passwords, but no passwords to gain access to the centralized systems. This is part of security culture. Having a system where you don't really know or care about protecting them is about your attitudes, how you and your organization care about these things, dig into them or think, well, you know, it's been good for 20 years, it will be good for the next 20 years. My name is Kyle Wood. I will uh, share some of the findings of our recent research. Because it's a GDPR track, I will be talking a little bit about GDPR. I will try not to bore you about that one. And I am here because I'm supposed to know shit. I've been doing this for 20 years now. Uh, my work has been seen around the world. But since I'm from Norway and uh, we are all in the Nordics, we don't really do self-promotion, do we? So let's skip that one and go directly into this one. This is more important, right? <laughs> and I take your nervous laughter as a token that, yeah, you probably fear that it's me again, right? We will see about that. I will get back to the answer, who is best when it comes to security culture, Norway or Sweden. Or maybe there are some other countries. Who knows? But before we can actually answer that question, we need to know what security culture is and how can we measure these things. So security culture is part of culture. Culture is the ideas, the customs, the social behaviors of a particular group of people. So your colleagues at your workspace, for example, all the Swedes or all the Norwegians, or all the people in the Nordics. We, we share some cultural artifacts. And then, of course, there are differences. There are scientists out there working to understand these differences and these similarities, and these people are called social scientists. Psychologists, sociologists, uh, anthropologists, probably humanists and philosophers as well, depending on your school of thought. Uh, but these people are supposed to know people. And when I want to know about people and about culture and how we work together, who better to ask than the social scientists? So we did that, and based on their knowledge and understanding, we created a tool to measure security culture based on seven traits. So we, uh, we are looking at behaviors. And behaviors are, what do you do, and what do you see other people do in your organization? We look at cognition, which is how you receive, uh, work with, improve, and act on knowledge. We look at the attitudes, for example. How do you sort of care about security? Not at all, some say. And we look at how people communicate these things. So, for example, in your organization, do people talk about security? And if the answer is no, they don't, is that good? Or do we then end up with no passwords on the central control systems? Because if you don't talk about something, maybe it doesn't exist. Or if they do talk about security, how do they talk about it? Is it like, oh no, that security guy, he's going to shoot this project down again? Because that's it's known to happen, especially in the past. Then that is part of your culture. Then it's like, okay, security gets in the way of us doing what we are supposed to do. And then, of course, your colleagues, if you are a security guy, will probably not care too much about what you do and say, because for them, you are in their way. Or is it, as we see somewhere, 
oh, security is really cool. You know, yesterday I did this uh, training on passwords and I learned something. Then you have a very different culture. Using a tool like this allows us to pick up those sentiments around your organization and measure them. Not only once, but again and again and again. In doing so, we are creating a benchmark, a standard of measurement, something we can use to compare your culture with your culture, or Sweden against Norway, or your organization last year and this year, or your organization against other organizations. As we did uh, in our research report earlier this year, this is based on 2016 data of more than 10,000 employees in the Nordics within the bank and finance or financial services in, in insurance, I think it's, it's called the, the broad scope. And within that broad scope, there are subsectors. By having a standard of measurement, we can compare these subsectors. For example, we see there are differences, and I think that is reasonable to, to expect. For example, in this one, we see real estate activities. Real estate activities scores a lower score than monetary intermediation up there, which is typical or normal banking, as far as I understand. And I think that, hmm, that makes sense. I mean, if you are selling houses, yes, you need to, to, to care some about security because you do treat personal data, banking data, stuff like that. But a bank who do banking all the time probably need a better security culture. But the most important is that this kind of tools, this kind of standard of measurement, uh, measurement allows us to learn something about something we didn't know about yesterday. It may not be easy, but it's possible. And by doing so, we can learn how we can improve and then change. And hopefully tomorrow, or maybe next year, we will not read about the DDoS attack taking down the train systems in Sweden. Who knows? Now, I promised GDPR. That's why we are here. GDPR comes with a lot of interesting news, if you like. And I will not be mentioning fines. Oh, I just did. But it comes with two very important innovations in my uh, experience. One I discussed with um, one, of the, one of you guys earlier this morning, which is the jurisdiction. Suddenly, GDPR is supposed to be for everybody, every uh, organization around the world, as long as they treat something or someone in EU, which is very fascinating. I'm, I'm looking forward to see how that, uh, th those um, court battles will, will play out in the future, and I will try to not be part of those. <laughs> the other, and in my opinion, real important innovation is found deep inside Article 32, 1D. In there, GDPR moves away from tick box or check box compliance. You know, when your lawyer said that, well, you know, Kai, as long as you do something and you can prove that you did something, then we are actually home free. It didn't really have to work. And that's been my industry for the past 20 years. As long as you did something and can just say, we did something, it doesn't matter if it works or not. With GDPR, this changes. With GDPR, you need to measure the effectiveness of whatever activity you do. Not only technical, which is not that difficult, logging and stuff like that, but also on the organizational side. That means you need to measure security culture. And not only do you need to measure this culture, you need to be able to tell if it changes over time, which means you need a standard of metrics, of course. So this is one of the things we do in our tool. So this is uh, from one of our customers, with permission. I think they signed some papers somewhere. Uh, this shows 2016 score, the 65, and 2017 score, the 69. 
69 is more than 65, so surely they have had not only an effect, but a positive effect. And for those of you who fear a negative effect, that happens too. The good thing with GDPR is that it doesn't have to be a positive effect. As long as you can show that there has been some effect, they are fine. More importantly with a tool like this is that you can compare yourself internally. If you are in charge of this privacy and, and securing these processes, then you want to know which department are more or less secure. Where do they care more or less? Where are my low-hanging fruits? Where should I start my focus? You can only do that if you have a tool that allows you to compare the results over time and against each other. There's another thing been going on in the past, recent past, not only GDPR, but this thing here, Me Too. And just like GDPR, this is also culture. So me, I live in Norway. Uh, I do a lot of international business, so, so I follow some news from different sources. And my wife is Swedish, which means that we also pay attention to what is going on over here. One of the fascinating things is how different countries have been dealing with the Me Too events. Some countries have chosen outright witch hunting. Like, okay, I point at you, sir, and then everybody points at you, and then you die. On the stake, very public stake. Do we know if you actually did something? Nah, not really, because we don't ha really have the proof. Possibly. We may have, but we don't know, because it's only a trial by media, or even social media. Other countries have chosen to say that, well, you know, we recognize there is a problem. We also recognize that we do have a court system in this country. So instead of doing this public social media witch hunting, we drag these people to court where both parties get to present real evidence, sometimes police investigations, and then we do stuff. And then, of course, we have the cases of Hollywood, um, so, so I'm a big fan of this uh, television show um, where, where um, oh, oh, my memory is too early in the morning. Eh? Thank you, House of Cards. <laughs> I paid him for that. Um, and then that guy also knows what I'm going at. So, so House of Cards have this very popular uh, actor and this actor has been uh, blamed on doing some really bad shit. And who knows, maybe he did this bad stuff. I don't know. But what I personal th uh, personally think is that Netflix just gutting him and saying, we don't want anything we do with this person, bad or not, before we see the evidence. In my opinion, it's like, okay, mm, Cultural, cultural bias. Some lawyers wiping their hands clean, maybe. Uh, but the point here is that how we treat these things, how we treat gender and gender differences, matters. And it's culturally biased. I am a huge fan of gender equality. Not just saying that we should have it and equal pay and, you know, lip service kind of thing that most of the rest of the Western world. Because if you look at the facts, it's still a huge pay gap. It's still so that most people promoted to management are males. It's still so that it's a huge divide while we still claim that, oh, look at us, we are so good, and tapping us on the shoulder and say, well, you know, equality, it matters and we care, and we don't really do it, everybody knows so, but, you know, we care. To me, that is bullshit. Either we care and then we do something about it, and sometimes we need data for that, sometimes we need more data. So in addition to 
having 50% of the workforce actually getting paid what they are worth. We can take a look at how the genders differs from a risk and security perspective. Another reason to add more ladies up the chain and to pay them what they're worth, not what they get today. So what we are seeing here is comparison table about the two genders across the seven dimensions I mentioned earlier. What we see is that people like me, the guys, males, on the cognition thing, which is how I uh, take information, knowledge, interpret it, and apply it, I constantly tell myself, I get this. I understand security. I know this shit. It's not a problem. I don't need this training stuff because I already know it. That's what that graph is saying. Now look at the next one, the behavior. What does this say? Here I'm not on top. Suddenly, my knowing better is not being manifested in better behavior. In fact, I behave worse. And this gets worse as we follow the circle. And especially it culminates with attitudes. So I think I get this, I think I really know this, but I don't care about it. I don't behave as well about it. And then the opposite, the females, they think that, well, you know, mm, I don't get this as well as I probably should, but they do behave better. More importantly, they care about the rules, they understand why we need the rules, while I'm like, ah, rules? for them, not for me, and their attitudes towards security and risk management is much better than mine. To me, this is another proof why we need gender balance. Then the question is, what do we mean by gender balance? When do we have that? Is it 50%? 40%? Maybe 30 I don't know. I really don't know yet. But what I do know is that it's not three and a half or four percent as we saw at Uber the past two years. Got to be more than that. And it's not zero out of 10 people in the board, which we continue to see a lot, even here in the Nordics. Got to be closer to 50. Maybe 25, 30 is good enough, I don't know. But it certainly is not zero, and it certainly is not five. Now, now that we know that we can measure security culture, and that we can compare it across the different sectors, let's see, who is doing best? Did I hear Sweden? <laughs> I heard some careful whispering down there, Sweden. But is it really? So this data is from uh, roughly 1,800 employees in the bank and insurance sector in Sweden and Norway, and this was uh, collected uh, roughly one year ago. What we see here is that it's not that much of a difference, which is to be expected, sort of, because it's not that difference between Norway and Sweden, but there are some. Uh, for example, you guys do Fika. In Norway, we have no idea what that is. Uh, and in Norway, when we do lunch, you guys don't want to eat what we bring, right? <laughs> but there's one very interesting difference, though, and that is on this dimension up here, compliance. I was brought up thinking that in Sweden, you guys do consensus-based decision-making, which is one of the reasons you take so long to make decisions, but it means that when the decision is made, everybody knows what to do and then goes out to do it. So you comply with those decisions. In Norway, however, we may take long to make a decision, but suddenly, or finally, some king of the table says, well, this is how we're going to do it. Do we all agree? Then everybody says, yeah, 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 let's get some coffee now because we're tired of this. 
Then they leave the room, everybody agrees on the decision, but they go out and do whatever they want to do, which is not being compliant. But in the bank and finance industry, we see that mm, Swedes are less compliant with the Norwegians, which is interesting. Which, of course, then means that we need to dig deeper to see if this is really the truth. And we did that this year in a different industry sector. This is in the electric, um, electronic something. They make electronic things, computer things. Uh, and they operate in a number of countries, not only Sweden and Norway. And what we see here, so the yellow one is uh, Sweden and the red one is Norway. Suddenly, the picture is different. But what I find interesting is that both Norway, Sweden and Finland are followly, uh, follow each other in the uh, shape of the scores, although they differ in, in, in the uh, score sizes. Uh, while other countries, for example, Holland and England and Poland, have a different shape. Which, of course, leaves us with, uh, okay, so who is really better? And the answer is that mm, it, doesn't probably, it probably doesn't really matter. What does matter is that we need to be able to capture those differences so that we can decide where we want to attack so that we can improve the security culture that matters in our organization so that we can avoid the attacks on the railway or no password systems on our central management things. And that happens in Norway as well. Now, uh, all the research we have done is available for free in a 200-page report. I said free, but of course, if you do go through it all, uh, you will pay with your time. Uh, you can uh, download it, and uh, if you do, please feel free to shoot me questions and comments. Thank you very much. <laughs>